Welcome once again to the High Performance Human Podcast. It's Andy here, and I tell you what, the guests just keep getting better and better. And I tell you what, they, they, they're starting to get a lot more educated, which is giving me something of an inferiority complex. But um, they say that you are the sum of those around you. So I'm hoping by osmosis, I'll start to sound a little bit more intelligent at least. Uh, Dr. Christy Goodwin is joining me now. Um, Christy, I have met through a, uh, a speaking gang, shall we call it, um, a club of some description, of, of some description. and uh, I've been fascinated with uh, everything that Christy represents and everything that Christy is really, really driving uh, with respect to what her messages are um, that she wants to portray to the world. She has this fascination with how brains and bodies operate in the digital world. Now, gang... We know, we all know that we have this internal and external battle with technology and especially when it comes to the digital space uh, and in relation to our own high performance. And Dr. Christy Goodwin is, from what I know and the amount of homework that I've done on it, I don't know if there's many people that can articulate it much better than this human right here. And I'm saying that with all seriousness, team. So I'm really excited for what this episode's going to bring us all, and me included. Um, Christy, how are you? I am fabulous, and what an introduction. Thank you for those very kind words. Um, <laughs> this is a topic we're all grappling with, um, and I like to say, even though you've couched me in very professional terms um, and made me sound perhaps a whole lot better than what I am, um, I have a really complicated relationship with technology. Even though I research this, I speak about this, I, I, I'm, you know, really fascinated about technology. Um, I often say my relationship with my phone is a little bit like the relationship I have with my husband. Really hard to live with at times, but I also <laughs> couldn't, couldn't for a second manage living without it. And let's be honest, it's always turned on. Um, so <laughs> technology is complicated. You know, it's got its tentacles into every part of our lives, professionally and personally. But the harsh reality is that it's here to stay. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I'm fascinated with helping people um, take back control so that they're not a slave to their screens. Um, so they can certainly use technology. I know some people are sometimes tentative hearing these conversations because there's a misconception, you know, I'm going to suggest you do a digital detox or cancel your Netflix subscription. I'm here to do none of those. Um, mm. It's all about how can we use technology um, but use it in ways that, are aligned with how our brains and bodies were designed to function as high-performing humans. I can't wait for this chat. I'm really, really <laughs> I'm far I'm proper excited about it. Um, now, I am. This is cool. Um, now, um, first and foremost, though, before we get stuck into all of that, so much to unpack in what you just said, uh, give us a bit of a genesis story. So what yeah. got you to this point in your in your life in your career where you have had where you've gained grown you've grown such an obsession and such a fascination um, with this thing because it is it, this is prevalent yeah you and I, I, yeah i often say no one no human is immune to the digital pull and so i would love to pretend that i had a really clear career trajectory mapped out um i fell into this work purely by serendipitous events mm. um I had started my career as an educator, um, then I became an academic, and my initial research was around looking at the impact technology was having on children and teenagers developing brains and bodies. So I looked at the neuroscience and the psychology and the intersection with technology. Um, and then I uh, started to explore, because I was getting questions from a lot of adults saying, look, I know your research is on kids and teens. And I think for many years, we wagged the finger at young people and said they're addicted, they can't put it down, they throw techno tantrums. But we never once examined our digital habits as adults. Yeah. And we've often legitimized, you know, our unhealthy digital behaviors under the pursuit of, you know, I need to do it, it's for work. Um, and it was actually a really awful accident um, that happened with my son. So I had um, been in overseas um, for two nights, um, had flown back. And at the time, I only had two children since acquired a third. Um, but my second son, it was the first time we'd been apart for two nights. So I had flown back to Sydney, did what most people will still do at the baggage carousel, pulled out my phone and saw that awful red icon declaring that I had all these unread emails. Mm -hmm. I thought I'll triage those in the taxi ride home, fell asleep in the taxi. 
arrived home and my son decided to cancel his expected nap time. He needed some extra mummy cuddles that day. Um, and I had ambitiously scheduled a work call. Now, this is back before Zoom. This was a Skype call. So I had a mm -hmm. Skype work meeting booked in his expected nap time. When I knew there was no way he was having a nap, he needed some extra cuddles, I opened the lid on my laptop just to send one email to cancel that Skype call. But I saw that red icon declaring now that I think it was up to over 100 unread emails and I got yeah. sucked to the digital vortex. I became so digitally distracted, triaging, you know, the avalanche of emails that were there um, that I did send that one email and off I kept going. Now, I wasn't watching my son, Billy, um, as he climbed on, and he was about 15 months at the time. He climbed onto a lounge chair adjacent to where I was frantically working on my laptop. He fell off the lounge face first and required urgent hospitalization. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and still to this day, he has a terrible scar on his lip that is like a tangible concrete reminder to me. You know, I was researching kids and teens, but I, I realized at that point in time, as adults, we're struggling with, you know, feeling like we're always on, dealing with the, with the constant barrage of digital distractions. Mm. And this was the catalyst for me to say, what is it about the online world that draws us in? Why are, uh, you know, how is it impacting our performance? How is it impacting our well-being? So my research sort of broadened to look at the impact technology was having on all humans, um, but with a really practical, pragmatic solution. As I said, it's not about, you know, giving it up or abandoning it. Um, I don't talk about digital amputation. It's all about how can we make sure our tech habits are aligned with how we are neurobiologically designed as humans, so our brains and our bodies. And so, yeah, that's how I fell into this work, um, that awful accident. I will declare, just to ease my mother's guilt, my son had had a very similar experience two weeks prior when my husband was dutifully supervising him. So I'm just suggesting <laughs> a significant wound was just a reopening of an existing scar. <laughs> but, I mean, it's awful. Um but yeah, wow. a really powerful catalyst um, for me to look in the mirror and for us as adults um, to examine our digital behaviours because they're affecting so many parts of our performance and well-being. No, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Isn't it fascinating, right? On a completely side topic, a complete side topic. Isn't it fascinating how uh, we go searching and scratching for people to learn from and for people to give us our, our big epiphanies and whatnot when kids have got most of them uh, oh, okay. oh, honestly man I, one of my yeah. biggest epiphanies which we won't go into now um was belted it was it absolutely belted me across the face by my daughter who was about 15 16 months uh, it was similar yeah. similar 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 sort of age there you go. absolutely yeah. fascinating anyway that's the topic for another time uh, but as is the case with all of our episodes of High Performance Humans, we uh, we we like to think that there's four pillars to to uh, go that go in towards high performance, being success, connection, influence, and happiness. I am fascinated, Dr. Christy Goodwin, as to what your definition of a high performance human is. Oh, I love this question. Um, in, to me, high performance is optimizing your performance, both your physical and psychological performance. And I think there's a, a symbiotic relationship between the two. But the key for me is about sustainable performance. We are seeing, you know, global um, high rates of stress and burnout. A study was published just yesterday at the time of recording this that is telling us that 43% of working women uh, 30% of working men are currently experiencing burnout. Mm. And what I think we are seeing, um, and, and the reason I say sustainable, is because I think our digital behaviours and habits that have crept in professionally and personally have um, pushed us away from what I call our human operating system, our HOS. Our brain, as humans, we have some biological constraints. You know, We have a biological blueprint that we have to adhere to, give or take. And the reason that I think we're seeing increasing rates of stress and burnout and unsustainable performance is because people are not working in congruence with their human operating system. I think our digital habits have eroded and, and uh, I think we have been nudged away from how we're designed to operate. And I think two things have happened. Are you happy for me to explain these or do you want to? 
No, Jump you go. Yeah. You're a, you're a real rocky. Okay. You go. So how technology and the reason, and, and I'm not saying technology is the only cause. Um, you know, I think we've got sort of more macro issues around, you know, a performance culture that, that reveres constant hard work, you know, um, diminishes the returns on, on rest and, and recovery. Um, but for me, if we are operating in alignment with how our brains and bodies are designed, then we will achieve peak performance. The reason that I think many of us are not having that sustainable peak performance is because our tech habits have done two things. The first thing is that our digital habits have added a whole lot of little micro stresses to our days. Now on their own, these would be benign. They would be harmless. Things like alerts and notifications, um, multitasking, um, uh, video calls. All of these little things are really taxing on our brains. Even the fact that when we look at a screen, a laptop, tablet, smartphone, our eyes converge. Biologically, when our eyes converge, it triggers the stress response. Because as humans, we aren't designed to spend hour upon hour looking at a small surface area. We are designed to dilate our gaze. So we've added all of these tiny little stressors, micro stressors, they're tiny, um, into our days because of our digital habits. The second thing that's happened at the same time is that our digital habits and behaviours have completely eroded some of the biological buffers that were once naturally baked into our days as humans that brought us back to a stress baseline that meant we could have sustainable peak performance. Connection, human connection. Um, sleep, we know our tech habits are having a huge impact on the quality and quantity of our sleep. The most rudimentary peak performance protocol is getting good sleep. Um, we're more sedentary than we have ever been as humans. You know, a really scary study has recently been published telling us that if we sit in total for more than five hours a day, as many people now do, even if we hit the 150 minutes of cardiovascular movement in a week, that is the recommendation, if we're sedentary for more than five hours, those cardiovascular benefits are completely nullified if we don't break that sedentary sitting up with movement. Mm. Um, even the way we breathe. I mentioned before when we have a, a narrow gaze when we look at a screen, we also know as humans we, we should sigh while we're awake every five minutes. Not the really melodramatic hands on my hip. I'm really pissed off. <laughs> on your side. Although that is in although that is induced in relatively regular occurrence. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. But we should be sighing every five minutes while we're awake. But new research tells us that when we're looking at a screen, our sigh rate falls off the cliff. Yeah. So it's just that simple physiological response of sighing and regulating our stress response isn't happening when we're looking at a screen. So it's those two things, little micro stresses that have accumulated in our days and at the same time the erosion of those buffers that used to bring us back to a stress baseline. That's why I think we're seeing increasing rates of stress and burnout and you cannot achieve sustainable peak performance if you are stressed and or burnt out. So there's my long-winded answer to your you know relatively what? simple question. See what I mean, gang, right? You come on here expecting to have uh, very, very base level <laughs> conversations brought to you by a very simple Englishman. And then this absolute siren of intelligence comes waltzing through <laughs> and, um, and, and just absolutely drops truth bomb after truth bomb. This is ridiculous. Um, I, I, this is so fascinating. We could be going on here for a while. Um, and we've only got 40 so minutes. So I've got to be as quick as I can. Um, insane amount of value just in that opening monologue gang you better damn well re rewind this hit the 15 seconds back a few times and re-listen to that bit because that was mental how alerting uh i think is is, is a word that i think you could use for what uh, christy just said just there um but so obvious when it's pointed out to you like that yeah it's obvious we all whinge about things like you know the notifications thing and the little red icons and all this sort of crap right but when it's put into that 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 really really tangible uh, uh terminology of micro stresses yeah it's 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 like you can apply it to any sort of element of your life right like your finances for example you don't think that spending uh five dollars a day on a coffee is doing you much harm, but you accumulate that over time and it becomes a bit of a financial hit. 
It's the same with your fitness. I, I'm a massive, massive believer um, in the um, in the accumulation of agri- ag- aggregation of incremental gains. Right. So Dave for yeah. yeah. um, you know, one percent better every day over time yeah. accumulates. Um, but it works the other way as well. Um, you know, it just works the other way too. And and I think that. You're absolutely spot on there. Now, I really want to dig into the second one, though, the biological erosion bit, uh, because I have got this belief around technology that uh, the amazing thing and the scary thing is the fact that the the rate of growth of technology and, and its purpose in life, it's making humans, it's forcing humans to have to be more human, yes. right? And And as a result of that, some people are living La Vida Loca and they think it's the best thing since sliced bread. But there's there's a huge majority of the population, um, I dare say, um, that are really in fear of it because technology has really done a hell of a lot to mask inadequacies in, in whether it's us as humans, whether it's us as professionals. It's making up for things that we're crap at, right? Um, um, but I think it's getting to a point now where it's exposing yes. our lack of attention that we've paid to our intrinsic DNA as human beings, um, I think. It, with res- th- this biological erosion thing, and you talk about the fact that human connection is really, really important, and it's really it's really critical for, for us to survive as, as a species. Um, the balance of power... It's weird. I think it's weird. I just feel like there's balance of power between technology and, and humanity. It's almost like tech's getting that big that we've only got one play left. Mm. The human. Yeah. How do you see the landscape as a macro thing? And I know this is a big question. How do you see the, the landscape in a macro sense when it comes to this, this whether you call it a tussle, whether you call it a Co- coercion of technology and humanity. Where do you see it? What's your personal take? Look, it, it's evolving. You said something before that really I think is important to acknowledge. The reason I think so many of us are struggling to find our footing in this digital world um, is because the technology that we all use and rely upon professionally and personally is evolving at exponential rates. Mm. In the online world, we've got something called the digital penetration rate, and it describes how many years it takes a digital technology to penetrate to 50 million global users. Mm-hmm. So believe it or not, dial up internet. Do you remember delayed gratification of sitting there with a do 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 That took <laughs> seven years to hit penetration rate. Uh, Facebook took four years. YouTube took two years. Angry Birds took about 35 days. Pokemon Go took around 19 days. ChatGPT took between one to two days. Wow. So the, the rate of adoption, the rate of change is growing exponentially. But as you so beautifully articulated, what hasn't shifted, what hasn't evolved um, at the same pace is our neurobiology. Yeah. As humans, it takes us years, years, thousands of years to evolve and change. And so I often say we have ancient Paleolithic brains and bodies trying to operate in a high-tech digital world. Mm. And so, you know, a common thing I get people saying to me is, and again, related to, to connection, you know, we're more connected than we've ever been, but we're also more disconnected as humans. We have mm. a global loneliness epidemic. The US Surgeon General re- released a really compelling paper, um, I think it was two years ago, on this global issue. We, you know, we've got ministers for loneliness. And so the technology, whilst it is growing and changing, isn't always being developed in ways that are congruent and, and not just developed, but adopted in ways that are aligned with how we are designed as humans. So for example, we know that when we have any text-based communication, an SMS, you know, a WhatsApp message, a Teams chat, um, our brain produces cortisol, the stress hormone, um, for a whole host of reasons. You know, the narrow gaze, we're not breathing the same way, let alone what the content of the message might be or the wrong choice of an emoji, you know, or a really terse reply. Um, but our brains tend to produce oxy, uh, sorry, sorry, um, cortisol in text-based communications. Compare that to when we have an in-person connection, you know, a water cool conversation in the office, dinner with our friends, you know, coffee with a colleague. Our brain produces oxytocin, which is the social bonding hormone. We cannot replicate that in a digital format yet. 
Will we be able to? I'm not quite sure. People are suggesting, you know, that the use of holograms and other video technologies as they'll evolve will help with that in a, a stronger way. But at the moment, we haven't got any evidence to suggest that that is the case. So I think we've, as you said, rightly said, we've got to go back to how we design to function as humans. You know, what are our fundamental biological needs? Connection. You know, sunlight. So many people today, in fact, 90% of adults, it is reported, reach for their phone before their partner first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. Sunlight exposure in that first hour of our day does two really important things for our brain. First and foremost, I hope you don't mind me going off on a tangent. <laughs> you tanned your way. Thank you. Um, first and foremost is when we get that sunlight exposure, it activates our brain's hypothalamus. This is the part of our brain that puts us in an alert focused state. Yet so many of us today wake up, sit on our devices, get in you know, public transport or the car and get to the office. So we're not getting that sunlight exposure. So we're not in that aroused focused state. The second thing that happens magically just by sunlight exposure in the, the first sort of hour of waking up is that 16 hours later, our body magically produces the sleep hormone melatonin. And so, again, our tech habits are impacting on this because many of us are not getting that sunlight because we're inside on our devices. Um, so, so to our kids and teens, we're on devices till later at night. And we know that blue light obviously has a huge impact on our quality and quantity of sleep. So there's sort of almost like these digital intrusions and behaviours that we've adopted often unconsciously, um, that are completely incongruent with how we're designed to, to function and behave um, as humans, let alone as high-performing humans. And this is it. Before we can, before we can even talk about high-performance, yeah. um, because um, Dr. Goodwin is going to be giving us some really good uh, sort of bits of advice around things that we can do in order to improve our journey towards high-performance in a digital world. But before we even get to that, We've got to work on fundamental mechanics, right? Absolutely. We can't, you know, we can't strive for high performance if our foundation's as shaky as it is appearing to be, um, you know. But I think we're very, very quick. And tell me if you think, if you disagree here. Um, we're very quick to blame technology, yeah. right? We're very quick to do that. You know, the, the vo I mean, Congress just had the, the CEOs of each social media platform hilariously at times uh trying to bag them out and whatnot no i'm from singapore congressman how many times do i have to say that to you um um but like it's it's not technology's fault it's no. not technology's fault now in in your opinion that you being such a, a an expert around this world um we and, and a lot of this conversation has been you know in a concern sort of negative, got to be really worried about it sort of stuff. Let's have a look at it on the other side, though, right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, with challenge comes opportunity. In terms of fundamental humanity, knowing what you know, which is a hell of a lot, um, what, where are the opportunities? Where are, you know, when we've talked, and you've mentioned connection a few times and what have you, where can we see, what is the silver lining? Can you articulate the silver lining here? Because... I'm very much a silver lining over the cloud type kind of guy. Um, and, and I think we need to have more of a conversation around this bit. Um, what's your take? Where's the silver lining for you? Oh, look, I, and I'm a huge advocate for the positive potential of technology. Um, one of the things that we're struggling with in the digital age, and I'll give you the positive slant, is that we are experiencing something called infobesity. Um, I often say to people, do you feel like you are the emoji of the head exploding most days? And I get an emphatic nod from a lot of people. <laughs> uh, it is estimated that the average adult is consuming 74 gigabytes worth of data professionally and personally every single day. Wow. That's more than our ancestors would have consumed in a lifetime. Now, mm. if we go back to our brain, the part of the brain that's sort of the brain's hard drive or the memory center, it's called the hippocampus. Our hippocampus has not got any larger structurally to accommodate that extra information. Mm. So what's happening is people are forgetting things. There's a, a research term being um, investigated at the moment called digital dementia. And it's this idea that our memory making capacity is shrinking 
just because of the sheer volume of information that we are processing every single day. Mm. And so our brain may not be able to get extra hard drive on it. You know, we may not be able to pump up the size of our hippocampus, but this is where technology can be a great assistive tool. What can you cognitively offload? You know, something as simple as not having to remember phone numbers anymore. You know, your contact list does that. Are there tasks that you could automate or set reminders? Um, are there documents that you could create for repeatable tasks? Um, I'm really excited by the, the um, beginning stages of AI, especially in workplaces. If you can offload some of the repetitive, rudimentary tasks that will free up your time, um, you know, I, I'm doing a little bit of research on Microsoft's Copilot tool. It's slowly being rolled out in organizations. Mm -hmm. There are huge productivity gains to be had from using some of these digital technologies that will offload some of our cognitive resources um, and also our, our time. So I think there's a huge potential. But again, it's about us choosing how we use the technology um, and using it in really intentional and purposeful ways rather than just sort of adopting these digital habits that don't serve us, instead just enslave us to our screens. You can almost, you can relate it to um, that that adoption curve um, that's that's used quite commonly, right? Where you've got your early adopters and then you've got yeah. the masses um, that just sort of lemming their way into the use of whatever it is that we're using and whichever platform's the fad of the day and, and what yeah. have you. Um, can we suggest then, therefore, that, if, if, if we're to get on the front foot, uh, for want of a better phrase, and and look at how we can fundamentally as human beings improve uh, our own operating platform, uh, then would it be to see how we can improve our ability to go from being a mass uh, a mass adopter to like an early adopter, like the skills the skills involved in transitioning from being one of the many to trying to shift that curve uh, a little bit further forward so that there's a lot more of us that have that early adopter mindset. Because you know that the early adopters are the ones that look at it from the positive, go, right, yep. wicked. How can I use that to, how can I use that to my advantage, right? And in my uh, home turf, shall we call it, which is the real estate space, uh, I, you know, the early adopters have gone ballistic on it. And then everybody else who's who's become aware of it over the the, 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 the subsequent period of time, the vernacular's been, oh shit, is this gonna take our job? Uh, Realestate.com gonna use this to take our, you know, to take our jobs away from us. Are we gonna become the forgotten middleman and blah, 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 blah. Um, so what in our skill set can we do, or what in what in our skill set can we focus on as human beings that can get us from a mass a mass adoption mentality over to that early adopter mentality. Yeah. I think something you said earlier um, is the solution to this conundrum that you've pointed out, and that is we have to align how we are designed as, as humans. What are those rudimentary things that we need? And then looking for the gap in technology. I think we're often driven by the technology. What's its functionality? What can it do? Whereas I think we're better off to say, this is what I need at a, a fundamental rudimentary level to function as a human. How can technology best serve me? Yeah. Um, so going back to all the basic, you know, the biological buffers, we have to sleep. We have to be physically active. You know, there are great technologies that I, you know, I'm a huge fan of wearable technologies um, to, to keep me accountable and to, to, you know, remind me about my physical movement throughout the day. Um, you know, that that human connection. Um, one of my big criticisms with technology for all of us adults kids alike is that we have lost the art of stress resilience. Technology has made us very comfortable with being comfortable. Mm. Um, Paul Taylor has written a fabulous book um, called Death by Comfort. Um, and he talks about similar things um, where technology, you know, we're hot, we flick on the air conditioner. We're cold, we grab a jumper. We're hungry, we order Uber Eats. We are living in an age of instant gratification. And when we very really, because, sorry, very rarely experience physical stress, we're often ill-equipped to deal with psychological stress. 
So again, as humans, we do need to experience stress, you know, small amounts and our brains and bodies are designed to resolve the stress cycle. But technology has come in and we've adopted, whether we're the early adopters or the mass adopters often, um, we've sort of voraciously uh, uh, consumed and, uh, you know, embedded these technologies into our life but haven't actually stopped to ask, is this helping or harming me? Um, so I think we've got to go back to those fundamental things that we need um, as humans and then look at where we can bring the technology in rather than be driven um, by what the technology's functionality or capabilities might be. I hope I answered. Is that why ice baths are becoming really popular? Absolutely. So, yes, um, one of the micro habits that I often talk about and th that overwhelmingly comes out from audiences after I've spoken when I ask, what's a micro habit that you're going to implement after today? Ice baths, um, any sort of deliberate cold exposure. Um, we know when you have just even a 30 to 60 second cold shower after your lovely warm shower, you can see up to a 250 to 500 percent increase in dopamine, noradrenaline and norepinephrine. They are fancy words for chemicals that are going to do two things to you. They're going to make you feel good and they're going to help you to focus. Yeah. There is no known legal substitute that will get you feeling that high. Plenty of illegal substitutes and, and <laughs> things you could take, but it would be remiss of me to talk about those on this you know, reputable podcast. Um, but again, just working with our neurobiology um, and or should be done first thing in the morning, but such a simple protocol we can put into place so that we've experienced that physical stress, we can be primed to focus, and we are developing that that stress resilience that I really think so many of us are lacking in today's world of instant gratification. Stress resilience, gang. That's a big one. That is a massive one. It's probably one of the reasons why everybody's getting triggered at work these days, right? Um, uh, you know, they, they, that, that, oh, I feel triggered. No, it's just you, your skin's that thin uh, yeah. that I think, I think Augusta Wind would probably trigger you, to be fair, in some respects. Um, and I think you can even point it towards why everybody's so bloody offended these days. Yeah, yeah you could, couldn't you? Um, because we've become so accustomed and comfortable with, like you said, instant gratification, having everything on the tip of your thumb. Uh, I I often uh, I often sort of reflect on first world problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, my partner, who um, is Iraqi born, war refugee, she knows what problems are, right? And it's and it's yeah. the sound of bombs whirring overhead and all that sort of stuff. That's proper problems. Yeah. And one thing that she one one uh, influence that she's having over me is is. It's not a case of not sweating the small stuff. It's actually having the awareness to be able to just handle the normal stuff. You yeah. know, it, 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 it's. I mean, I like to think that I can handle pressure and stress quite often, but if if it's not something I'm focused on, then I can. You know, the whole whinge and pom thing becomes legit. It, it kicks <laughs> into gear, right? It really does. I mean, you talk about lack of sunshine. Try yep. being in a country that has no sunshine, yep. right? Um, so, and I didn't realize how important that was till I came over here. Yep. Um, but what you've mentioned there about about um, uh, stress resistance, it's something that people don't think we have control over, but there are things that we can do that can help us to gain control over it, right? You talk about becoming a slave to technology. I, 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 I have this thing around time where you can either become a slave to your diary or a servant of your diary, right? Um, a slave to the game or a servant of the game. Um, and, and where being a servant means that you are consciously making decisions that you are uh, and actions you are taking in order to better you and those around you. Um, mm -hmm. whereas being a slave to game is just like, as soon as your phone rings, you shit yourself because you think I'm going to lose business. Yeah. Can I talk about that? That's such an important thing. And especially for high performers, um, mm. you know, that in the online world, we have something that's called the urgency fallacy Right. in the digital world. Everything feels urgent and important. Yep. Why go back to what we said earlier? We've got these ancient brains. Our brains were biologically designed to go and forage, hunt, get information mm. at a time at a volume and at a cadence that used to suit us. You know, we used to go and borrow a book from the library. We used to ring someone's secretary to make an appointment for a meeting. We used to go and get information. 
but in our always on digital world where we're getting, you know, alerts, notifications, unsolicited information constantly being thrust at us. Um, you know, the fact our notification bubble is red. Red is a psychological trigger for urgency and danger. The fact that we didn't ask for it to come to us, um, you know, the unpredictable reward ratio, you know, we don't know if that text message or that Teams message will be something really important. And that unpredictable reward ratio gets us hooked onto constantly checking. Mm. So we have been duped through some of the design mechanics of the technologies um, that we use professionally and personally into thinking that everything is urgent and important. And so we have to be so diligent, especially if we want to achieve peak performance, about recalibrating, firstly, our priorities um, and, and assessing whether something is really, you know, triaging the urgency of something. Because in the digital world, you know, even the fact you've got a metric telling you how many unread DMs or messages you've got drives our behavior. Um, yeah. So there are pragmatic things we can do, um, but this is a really big one as I see it, especially for high performers um, who do want to often be responsive. We don't always have to be. We've just been tricked into thinking we should be. And this segues us in quite nicely into the next part of the conversation where um, you you have uh, across uh, your website and whatnot. And by the way, gang, website's going to be in the show uh, for Christy, is going to be in the show notes. Don't even think twice, right? Call to action, go and have a look at it because there's some really interesting stuff that she's got on there in her blogs and her articles and, and whatnot. You talk a lot about brain-based protocols uh, that uh, we can bring into our lives. And so I want to I want to get sort of a handful, if I may, yep. uh, of, of some of your brain-based protocols that you feel would instantly or actively contribute towards someone heading towards their version of high performance. Excellent. And thank you. Uh, um, I really do want, I'm, I'm a, I call myself because a client accidentally introduced me as a pracademic. Uh, it was a Freudian slip. He meant to say Christy's practical and she's an academic, but he yeah. blended the two words accidentally. Um, I love research and science, but it has to have a realistic application. So I often share what I call a menu of micro habits. What are the simple, small little tweaks that we can make without having to do, you know, the radical digital overhaul? So if I was to share a couple of things that I think have really tangible benefits, particularly for high performers, um, first and foremost is work with rather than against your biology or your neurobiology. So one of the best things you can do is to determine when is your peak performance window. Now, this is biologically determined. I'm sure your audience, you've probably heard, Andy, about your chronotype. Would that be right? <laughs> yeah. Invariations so of a theme, yes. Yeah. So identifying when you, when you do fire on all cylinders, and it's actually biologically determined by your PER3 gene. So you can't shift your chronotype. Unfortunately, it's determined by your biology. Um, and it dictates when you're most alert and focused. It also dictates what time of the day you should naturally fall asleep. And there's some variation. We're either sort of the morning person, a middle person, middle bird, or we're the night owl. Your job or your responsibility as best you can. You don't have to adhere to this 100% of the time. It's just not feasible. But where you can, when you are most productive, can you build a fortress around your focus during that window of the time, some of the week? So for me, I fire on all cylinders early in the morning. Uh, so I try to, um, before I do some exercise in the morning, I try and do a little bit of deep focused work. When I was writing my book, it was the prime time for me to, to, to get some good writing done. Um, is it doing some data analysis? Um, I would really ring fence that time. So related to that, how do we build a fortress around our focus? Controlling notifications. I've got three golden rules with notifications. One, disable non-essential notifications. You know, do you really need the humble LinkedIn brag, you know, about an ex-colleague's promotion? I don't think you need that notification. <laughs> don't believe, unless you're in sales or customer service, I do not believe any other knowledge worker needs email notifications. Really? We get, you know, tricked into constantly nibbling on our inbox because we get the ping dance across the screen or our phone vibrating. So turn off non-essentials. Um, 
Do you all know how to bundle or batch your notifications? You know, you can now on most platforms, certainly on Teams and Slack, um, on WhatsApp, so social media notifications, you can nominate what time or times of the day you want those various notifications coming to you rather than them dribbling in, you know, throughout the day. And the third rule with notifications is to create VIP lists. So when you activate in your peak performance window focus mode, or do not disturb mode, everybody else gets blocked apart from those people on your VIP list. Maybe you've got aging parents, maybe you've got kids in preschool or, or, or childcare or school. Maybe it's a colleague or a client and you're working on a time sensitive project and they do need to be able to reach you. So really controlling those- Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's one person you missed out there, my, uh, my friend. Your mother-in-law? I haven't no, seen that one. No, sure. definitely not uh -huh. your mother-in-law. Definitely not your mother-in-law. <laughs> what about your bloody ball and chain? Yeah, partner. Absolutely. Yep, partner. Yeah. Yep. Let them on the list. Uh, <laughs> well, it depends. Are you having a good day? Did you have a rocky morning? <laughs> <laughs> You'll very quickly realise your status when your partner is blocking your calls. You're like, I'm not on that VIP list. <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't I a V? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so just to recap, um, you know, identify when you're most productive. If you're working with a team, one of the simplest things you can do is to identify what's the dominant chronotype in your team. If you are, and I've found I've done a lot of work with um, real estate agents over the years, they tend to often be, not always, tend to be the early birds. They're, they're very characteristic, like starting off, if not middle birds. Um, why on earth would you be having a team meeting at nine o'clock every morning if that's most people's deep productive time? Wouldn't that be better for them to be writing up proposals, doing some market analysis, like just being more strategic, not all the time? Yeah. Um, a study, um, I'm trying to think where it was published. A study was published, I can remember the statistic, um, Harvard Business Review published a study several years ago and they found that most knowledge workers only spend around 5% of their work week doing their deep work, their focused work in their most productive hours. Yeah. So not very often was there that alignment. They bumped that up to 20% a week. So they said, try to have the equivalent of one full day of the week, trying to do your focused work during these sort of peak productivity hours. What resulted from that study was a whopping 55% increase in productivity. Why? Wow. We just align our neurobiology with, our work patterns. So that sort of leads on to my third one. Um, so we've just, we've done our, our chronotype. I talked about managing notifications. My third micro habit that I recommend is to work in sprints, not marathons. I call them digital dashes. Um, sitting down and consistently pumping out 14 hour days is a surefire way to deplete your cognitive resources. The harsh reality is the part of our brain that does our, our thinking, it's called the prefrontal cortex. Our prefrontal cortex has a four to six hour battery life per day. Now, don't get me in trouble. Please do not go to your HR people and say, look, I know people are talking about the four day work week, but this lady I heard on Andy's podcast said I should have a four hour work day. I'm not suggesting that, but for you to do the mentally taxing, robust work, you really have a four to six hour battery life per day. So we're not designed to sit down and keep doing, you know, taxing, exhausting work. We've sort of got a four to six hour window. So what we know, the best way to optimize that is to work in no more than roughly 90 minute cycles. And that is because our body has these ultradian rhythms and ultradian rhythms mean basically we go through a peak for about roughly, it's not precise science, roughly about 90 minutes. And then we have a trough for around 20 minutes. So we need to sort of adhere to that architecture as best we can, when we can, um, so that we optimize our performance. So if we can work in a, I call it a digital dash and then do something restorative. The biggest thing, and I work with a lot of high performers and as a high performer myself, the thing I know I struggle with um, is acknowledging that rest is absolutely integral to my performance. It's not an optional extra. It's not something I should save up for my annual leave. We have to see rest as a responsibility, not as a reward. And I think that, it, and I know um, it is something I personally struggle with, um, but we have to reframe the, the, the cognitive benefits of taking breaks um, to be really strategic if we sort of want to have that next productivity peak. Yeah, and if you take, if you take one or two of them, 
yeah, you know for a fact. Like as you were talking through them, then uh, Doctor Goodwin, the I was feeling a sense of stress just just dissipating from my psyche, and just at the thought of some of these things, right? Which is, and if that's happening at the thought of it, then jeepers, the practical application of some of these is is off the charts. I love that you know when you talk about your your, um, your chronotypes and whatnot. The amount of times that I've worked with real estate teams and they're talking about meetings and, and how painful they are and all this sort of stuff. When we all, oh, I say we all know, I know that, um, and you observe that with a lot of humans, they have a natural lull in uh, productivity, like directly after lunch, right? They kind of go into a little bit of hibernation mode and, and what have you. Um, and that's probably where productivity is very, very least. Uh, so that wouldn't be a bad idea to have something there that keeps everybody accountable to each other, like a meeting where you can, you know, get everyone back into the gear, let them ease back into it. And then by the time they finish their meeting, they're feeling a bit more ready to go and a bit more on point. Make more, it would make plenty of sense. Um, yeah. fascinating. Um, now I could talk to you forever, but I'm conscious that you've got lots of people to go heal with your doctorness and, um, and, oh. and, and, uh, and the last question that I'm really enjoying asking uh, our guests more recently, and it's sort of, it, it sort of, you've hinted at it just before. I'm asking all of our guests, what is the one thing that they feel is missing from their performance in their journey towards whatever the higher level of performance is for them? You said that rest is a massive Achilles heel for you. Um, would you say that's the that's the big one for you? It has, and it's been the biggest lesson that I've had to learn, and I've had to learn it, to be honest, the really hard way. I'm happy to share this story. Um, unfortunately, as many people did, I contracted uh, COVID at the height of the pandemic. I had been, a, you know, I was a very fit woman in her early 40s. I'd been fully vaccinated. I expected it to be a blip on the radar. I was, um, unfortunately, when I had COVID, experiencing uncontrollable seizures. I was rushed to a code red ward in a hospital. Uh, I was laying there in the paper petition um, and unfortunately heard the lady next to me pass away, literally taking her last breaths. Yeah. Um, and as I lay there, myself struggling to breathe, the doctors and health professionals were at a loss to explain why. They, they said, you know, there's no underlying health issues, you're very fit. Um, you know, we cannot explain medically why you are so ill with, with, with COVID. After seeing an extensive range of specialists, the only medical answer that I got um, was that I experienced COVID so badly uh, because I had been also in a state of burnout. Um, I wasn't sort of walking the talk. Um, I wasn't implementing the protocols that I researched and knew worked. I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And so I have had to confront the harsh reality um, as a human that we can't outperform our biology. Um, and so if you are not consistently sleeping, if you are not seeing rest and recovery as, as an absolutely integral part, I call it, for me, I reframe it. I don't call it rest. I call it a peak performance pit stop. Semantics, because in my calendar, I, look, I feel a little bit better if I see it as a peak performance pit stop. But I know the tangible difference I feel when I have taken a break. Um, and the research is actually telling us that if we want to tackle burnout, two to 10 minute breaks, micro breaks, like in my book, I call them piccolo breaks, you know, the, the like a piccolo coffee, short, but they, you know, and small, but they pack a mean punch. Um, two to 10 minutes interspersed throughout our day is what has, science has proven is the best form of beating burnout. You know, yes, annual leave makes a difference. Yes, having some psychological detachment from our work each day for a couple of hours is important. But the most tangible, impactful difference is just taking piccolo breaks, you know, having a rest, doing something restorative. And I don't know about you, Andy, but when I switch off, like I go for a walk without my headphones in, I lay down and close my eyes. This is often, you know, I have a shower. That's when the complex problem I've spent months agonizing over, that's when the creative solution lands. When I'm going for a swim, when I'm going for a run, when I used to go on a plane without Wi-Fi. But today we have become conditioned to always filling that white space with a screen. Mm -hmm. And so we have to become better at being at more than ever today, being intentional with saying, I need to rest. 
Um, and and so I often say to high performers, where were you when you came up with your latest best idea? When did you? Where were you when you solved a complex problem? In my, you know, thousands of people I've spoken to, I've never had one high performer say to me in my spread in an Excel spreadsheet or in my inbox, not one. It's the shower, it's going for a walk, it's, go, you know, on holidays, you know, waking up first thing in the morning. And so we have to reprioritize um, and reevaluate the importance of rest and recovery um, if we want to sustain. I sort of think that we're circling back to what we started with. I'm all about sustainable performance. Um, and the only way you can do that is to work with your neurobiology. And an integral part of that is resting and recovering. This star oh, look is my Achilles heel as well, and and I think it would be for most of your listeners if they were. I think so. I think yeah. so because a lot of it, a lot of you know, if we if we if we're wanting to achieve more than than what we are currently, if we're wanting uh, to hit a higher level, of whatever it is that we want to, it comes with a natural level of anxiety, right, or Absolutely. anticipation, depending on how you interpret it. But uh, for me, I struggle to sleep purely based on the fact that I feel I could be doing something else. I could be doing this. I could be doing that, right? And and uh, it's funny you talk about the, you know, where you get your best ideas from. I've actually found online and it got delivered recently a waterproof notepad uh, for my shower. Uh, Love that. Yeah, I found a waterproof notepad that sticks on my showers, on my shower wall. Awesome. So, um, because I know for a fact, if I wait to get, to get to my phone, to put something in my phone or a note, I'll forget. Oh, yeah. that's your digital dementia coming out. <laughs> do, yeah, do. big time. Yeah, yeah. Big time. I'd love to see that. Please share. And that is a product I would love. And I know a lot of the people I work with would love. <laughs> that's clever. I thought so. Um, I thought so. Anyway, look, um, Dr. Christy Goodwin, I cannot thank you enough. I could have oh, you in it for hours. You are a fountain of fascination you really do you really are just wonderful uh with your knowledge and your awareness and the best thing is you 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 have all these incredibly clever words but you somehow make everybody help everybody to understand them where you know which without sounding patronizing which i think is wonderful so thank you so so much for your time with us today Uh, i would love to have you on again sometime down the track it would be an absolute honor um gang you're mad. You are absolutely off your rocker if you do not follow this individual in all seriousness because she throws out helpful stuff on a regular basis. You know, you have some people that are good as a fad. Well, Dr. Christy Goodwin is, should be a permanent you know, in your psyche. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Goodwin. Much yeah, appreciated. Thank you. I really I love that. That was such a robust conversation. Um, much appreciated. Thanks, Andy. All right, and gang, you guys, as always, stay safe, healthy, happy. Until next time, look after yourselves and each other, and we'll speak to you again on the next episode.